with some suggestion and spookiness. And because horror is such a personal passion of mine, this series will be unashamedly selective. I'm going to build my account around my favorite films and periods. And I'd like to start with the era when I believe horror cinema really came into its own, the first great age of Hollywood horror. An age which begins with this moment from 1925's silent Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom, played by Lon Chaney, has warned Mary Philbin's character never to look beneath his mask. It's a classic, shocking reveal. And it captures the essence of being a horror movie fan. It's about knowing you shouldn't look, but wanting to see. And then maybe getting more than you bargained for. Horror cinema is replete with pioneering filmmakers. Few more so than the man beneath the Phantom's makeup, Lon Chaney, the godfather of horror actors. Chaney was one of the giants of 1920s Hollywood, and among his few surviving contemporaries is a fellow cast member from the Phantom, Carla Lemley, the niece of the founder of Universal Studios She's now a spry centenarian. I can only say he was a genius. Whatever part that he played, he was that part. There's a story that Mary Philbin fainted when she took off his mask. It could have been true because it was enough to make anybody faint. Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces, played a succession of maimed and monstrous characters during the silent era in films like The Hunchback of Notre Dame and London After Midnight. His self-taught makeup skills drew on his background in traveling vaudeville and theater. Chaney described his talent as extraordinary characterization. He did all his own makeup. And it was pretty horrible, <laughs> you know? Yes, all that. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know how he did it himself, but he did. Exactly how Cheney achieved his makeup effects has always intrigued me. Fortunately, just as the Phantom lurked below the Paris Opera, the relics of Cheney can be found in the bowels of the Los Angeles Natural History Museum under the custodianship of Beth Whirling. So Beth, what treasures do you have for us here? Ah, we have Lon Cheney's makeup kit here. There he is, Lon F. Cheney, Hollywood, California. Wow, it's extraordinary. Holy relics. What's in here, Beth? Ah, uh, this is one of the glass eyes that Cheney had especially made. <laughs> it's particularly gruesome <laughs> in its own little box, isn't it? Mm-hmm. When I was a, a kid, I kind of grew up with the stories of um, the lengths he went to to create these things. He put mm -hmm. himself through an unbelievable amount of pain and that's an example of that. And to wear something that thick of a nut covering over almost your entire eye yeah. couldn't have been comfortable. It's not exactly a permeable lens, no, is it? No, <laughs> it's like putting a, a billiard ball in your eye. Mm -hmm. It's now believed that Cheney achieved the Phantom's famous missing nose effect using thin wire to pull his own nose back, creating that truncated, snout like look. Remarkably, he did much of this working on his own, but it turns out he had something to practice on. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. This is a life cast um, that Cheney had made of his own face uh, with glass eyes inserted. And he used this to practice um, some of his makeup techniques. And he would take a look, see if he thought critically, if he needed a little more here, a little less there, if he didn't like the look entirely. It was much easier to scrub it off and to decide looking at yourself in a mirror, so to speak, than to actually apply it on his own face. It's quite fitting, isn't it? Someone who's so obsessed with bodily dismemberment mm -hmm. ends up with his own head <laughs> in a box. <laughs> According to Hollywood legend, Cheney's ghost still haunts the Paris Opera set at Universal Studios, which, remarkably, has survived as a grand monument to the silent age. It's also a reminder that for all Cheney's astonishing transformation, the Phantom of the Opera is as much an exercise in epic spectacle as it is a claustrophobic horror picture. That's probably because Universal's founder, Carl Lemley, was no fan of horrific material. But the Phantom's success helped his ambitious son and partner, Carl Lemley Jr., to persuade him otherwise. Carl Lemley Jr. now set his sights on an even more chilling property, Bram Stoker's sensational vampire novel, Dracula. Jr. envisaged another extravagant production, but he was about to have his wings clipped. 